The Bible talks about seven archangels who will bring about God's wrath during the end times. These angels are mentioned not only in the Holy Bible, but also in other apocalyptic texts where they are said to be in the presence of God. But who are these seven archangels? And is it true that each one of them is more destructive than the other? You might want to stick around until the very end of this video to discover the true identity of these archangels and witness the destruction they shall ensue at their hands during the apocalypse. Angelic beings are quite the characters in various religious texts, especially in the Holy Bible. In Hebrew, they are called Malak, which translates to messenger, and in Greek, it's Angelos, which also means messenger. These spiritual messengers don't have physical bodies and serve as the go wings for God and us mortals. Even Satan, aka the fallen light bringer, whose God-given name was Lucifer, was also known as an archangel as he rebelled against God and became a demon. So what really is an archangel? Well, here is where it starts to get really interesting. An archangel is a higher rank than a regular angel. The Bible describes a hierarchy of angels divided into three triads, seraphim, cherubim, and thrones at the top, dominions, virtues, and powers in the middle, and principalities, archangels, and angels at the bottom. The term archangel is not explicitly used in the Old Testament, but it appears in the New Testament referring to angels like Michael. The idea of seven archangels comes from the book of Tobit, found in some Christian Bibles. While Martin Luther excluded Tobit from the Protestant Bible, it is present in other Christian denominations. Now, did you know that the two most well-known archangels, Michael and Gabriel, are mentioned in canonical texts while the names of the other four come from apocryphal sources? Sources like the Book of Enoch and the Apocalypse of Esdras, also known as the Fourth Esdras, will be discussed shortly. In the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah refers to the seven eyes that explore the entire earth on behalf of God. Many Bible scholars connect this concept of the seven eyes with the seven archangels standing in God's presence. Moving to the New Testament, Revelation chapter 8 mentions the seven angels standing before God and being given seven trumpets. The progression of the seven trumpets leads to the seven plagues, where the angels are instructed to pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. This role of the seven angels in Revelation is crucial at the end of time. There's excitement in the New Testament, particularly Revelation with its detailed account of the seven angels and their involvement in the divine plan. Now, who exactly are the seven archangels? Before delving into that, it's important to note that four popes have forbidden excessive devotion to angel names. This caution stems from St. Paul's warning in Colossians, where he advises against being seduced to angel worship, emphasizing the unique role of Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and humanity. Now, did you also know that Pope Zachary at the Council of Rome in 745 was the first to discourage angel worship? He condemned excessive fascination with angelic names. He also specified that only Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael mentioned in the scripture should be appropriately named by Catholics. Later popes, including Leo XII, Pius VIII, and Gregory XVI in the 1800s also condemned naming angels. However, a devotion to a fourth angel, usually identified as Uriel, has been tolerated in Catholicism. This stems from the apocryphal book of Fourth Esdras, and medieval Catholics sometimes included it in the Catholic Apocrypha. Traditions outside Catholicism provide full lists of seven archangels, with names like Uriel found in the Book of Enoch and embraced by Ethiopian, Greek, and Russian Orthodox traditions. The Catholic tradition typically acknowledges Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. The situation is similar for the Book of Enoch and the various Orthodox jurisdictions, with the exception being the Egyptian list, which has Uriel as Suriel with an S at the beginning. Despite this difference, it is evident that the names essentially remain the same. But let's pause for a moment, because things are about to take a turn. In Enoch, we encounter Raguel, Sarakael, and Ramiel. Similar names, such as Ragael, Fanuel, and Ramiel, are found in the Ethiopian tradition, with some variations in the Greek tradition, including Jagudiel, or Jehudiel, and Salatiel, which correspond to the other list, along with Barachio. For educational purposes, and not devotional ones, an exploration of these seven archangels will be conducted based on the Catholic tradition of Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and possibly Uriel, as well as the remaining archangels listed in the Greek Orthodox tradition, which provides the most available information. 
starting with the head of the list, St. Michael. The name in Hebrew, Mikhail, means who is like God. It's believed that St. Michael confronted Satan when he rebelled against God. Originally, Lucifer, the bearer of light, Satan, sought to become a god himself, prompting God to change his name to Mikhail, meaning Michael. References to St. Michael can be found in the book of Daniel, Jude, and the Apocalypse. Following St. Michael is the Archangel Gabriel, whose name in Hebrew signifies a mighty man of God or a messenger delivering messages. Gabriel is associated with significant events such as the birth of John the Baptist and the Annunciation of the Incarnation of Christ to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Raphael, the third on the list, derives its name from healing and God. Raphael appears in the book of Tobit and is linked to the angels stirring up the healing pool in the Gospel of John. This remarkable archangel has been given the responsibility of healing humanity comprehensively, with a particular focus on the physical well-being of all living beings. Uriel, the fourth angel, means the god of fire, or the light of God, and appears in fourth Ezra's. There's also a tradition associating Uriel with the protection of John the Baptist during the massacre of the Holy Innocents. The fifth angel is Salafiel, whose name means communication or prayer of God. He is the one who is represented as a helper, who helps in presenting prayers to God. The sixth angel is Jehudiel, whose name means glory, laudation or praise of God. He is often depicted holding a crown and a three-thonged whip, and is seen as an angel of justice and the patron of kings, judges and all magistrates in the orthodox tradition. Moving on to Barakail, the seventh archangel. His name signifies the blessing of God. According to their tradition, Barakal oversees all guardian angels, emphasizing the Christian belief that every person, regardless of their faith, is appointed their own guardian angel. Barakal, in this context, is considered the leader or supervisor of all guardian angels on earth and serves as the patron of children, family life and protector of homes. These are the seven archangels, each with a distinct role and significance in the orthodox tradition. Now there's a question that puzzles a lot of people, what do archangels look like? Well, this is where things get shocking. In the book of Daniel, we catch a glimpse of what an archangel might look like, possibly referring to Gabriel who's mentioned by name in Daniel 8 verse 16 and Daniel 9 verses 21 to 22. The description of an angel in Daniel 10 verses 5 to 6 portrays a figure clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz. The angel's form is likened to beryl, with a face like lightning, eyes akin to fiery lamps, and limbs resembling polished brass, and his voice resonates like a multitude. The amazing nature of their appearance is evident. In Daniel 8 verse 17, when Gabriel appears to Daniel, the latter was filled with fear and prostrated himself. This underscores the intimidating presence associated with angels. It's been suggested that encountering angels today might symbolize judgment. Additionally, if one believes in God in angels, encountering an angel could signify healing or the fulfillment of prayers. Even as Gabriel brought Daniel an answer to his prayers, his presence was still overwhelming. Whether delivering good or bad news, angels can evoke a sense of intimidation. Archangels like Gabriel can serve as principal messengers of God. For instance, Gabriel announced the birth of John the Baptist to Zacharias in Luke chapter 1 verses 11 to 20. Zacharias, initially skeptical due to his and his wife Elizabeth's advanced age, questioned how this could be possible. In response, God's messenger Gabriel reassured Zacharias, stating, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to shew thee these glad tidings. Due to Zacharias's continued disbelief, Gabriel decreed that Zacharias would be unable to speak until the prophecy came to pass. Gabriel also played a significant role in announcing the birth of Jesus to Mary. After Mary sought clarification about Gabriel's message and received an explanation, she responded with great receptiveness. But there's something else important to note here. Archangels can also take on a warrior-like role, as illustrated in the earlier reference to Michael's battle against the devil. They were instrumental in expelling Satan, once an angel of light, but now fallen into darkness from heaven. Archangels are associated with specific purposes, particularly during the end times. Now, what is the role of these seven angels during the apocalypse? Well, you might want to listen closely now. The revelation of the seven angels of the apocalypse is tied to the opening of the seventh seal, marking the beginning of the Great Tribulation period. In this period, the seven angels are given trumpets, and when they sound, 
God's wrath is unleashed upon the earth. Revelation 8 verse 2 describes seeing the seven angels standing before God, and they are given seven trumpets. These angels, mentioned in Revelation 8 verse 6, prepare themselves to sound the trumpets, each heralding a significant event. When the first angel sounds the trumpet, a third of the trees are burned and all the grass is consumed by hail and fire mixed with blood. This catastrophic event paints a vivid picture of the devastation caused by the first trumpet. Following the second angel's trumpet, a third of the sea turns into blood as a great burning mountain is cast into the sea. This event is reminiscent of the plagues in Egypt where water turned into blood. A third of the sea creatures die and a third of the ships are destroyed. The sequence of events mirrors the plagues in Egypt where one plague led to the next. The sounding of the third angel's trumpet results in a great star falling from the sky named Wormwood. This event causes a third of the rivers and springs to become bitter, leading to the death of many people. With the fourth angel sounding the trumpet, a third of the sun, moon and stars are darkened, causing a third of the day and night to be without light. This darkness is compared to the thick darkness that engulfed Egypt during the time of Moses. With the sounding of the fifth trumpet, demonic locusts torment the unsaved for five months, released by a fallen angel from the abyss. When the sixth trumpet is blown, four angels at the Euphrates lead a demonic horde, killing a third of humanity with fire and supernatural forces. Despite plagues, survivors remain unrepentant, continuing in sin. When the seventh trumpet is blown, the kingdom is declared as the Lord's. Destruction awaits those harming the earth. The temple opens, revealing the ark accompanied by heavenly phenomena. And that, my friends, is how the seven archangels play a great role during the apocalypse.